Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for, for coming to this. this. is the fifth session of the Waterloo sessions of the RQI 2020-2021 uh, uh, online conference. It's my pleasure uh, today to introduce our first speaker. Our invited speaker today is Alexander Smith, who is a professor at St. Anselm College in, in Dartmouth. And uh, uh, Alex, uh, whenever you want, uh, you can share screen. Okay. It will be yours. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Elio, and thank you, Rick, for organizing this and giving me the chance to speak. Um, the main idea I want to get across to you today is about some work I've been doing on what we're calling quantum time dilation. And it's basically asking the question is, what time does a clock see if it moves in a superposition of two different relativistic speeds or momentum wave packets? And to answer that question, I'm going to have to introduce uh, a few different things. The first is uh, this idea of a covariant POVM, and that's going to function as a time observable for us. So I want to explain a little bit about um, those objects. And then using these covariant POVMs, I'm going to talk a little bit about relational quantum dynamics. And this is a way that we can formulate quantum mechanics without appealing to any a priori background notion of time. It has a long a tradition in the quantum gravity community. And then I'm going to turn to uh, using this relational quantum dynamics to talk about this quantum time dilation effect um, and then comment uh, briefly on how this effect might manifest in some spectroscopic experiments. So this is all based on work that I've done with Mehdi Amadi, Kasper Debski, Andrzej Dragon, uh, Piotr Trotsky, uh, Philip Hoon, and uh, Maximilian Locke. So um, the first thing I want to just think about is quickly is how does time enter in our usual theories of physics? So for Newtonian mechanics, right, uh, Newton was pretty clear at the beginning of the Principia. He said that absolute true and mathematical time of itself flows equity with re without regard to anything external. And what he's saying is that, well, basically, this T that appears in Newton's law, it's an, it's an external structure to the theory to which we're going to use to define our dynamics. It's not like we write down F equals MA for time itself. Um, and I would argue, and I think the consensus of uh, most people would agree that we've really inherited this background notion of time in quantum mechanics. I think the easiest way to see it is if you think of Ernfest's theorem, and that's how we sort of reconcile the Schrodinger equation with uh, Newton's second law, is to really make that identification. One has to identify the T here in the Schrodinger equation with the T in um, Newton's, uh, Newton's law. The other sort of more common argument was given by Pauli and basically said, well, if we want a time operator, if we want to treat time dynamically in the quantum theory like we would do with, say, momentum and position, we would want some time operator. And um, we would expect the Hamiltonian to generate translations in that time operator. And so therefore, we would expect some kind of canonical commutation relation. But this kind of reasoning breaks down because if you expect that your Hamiltonian to be a, a real Hamiltonian or a physical one, um, then you would expect it to be bounded from below. And basically that rules out the possibility of constructing a self-adjoint time operator. And so Pauli said that, well, therefore we conclude the introduction of an operator T is basically forbidden and the time T must necessarily be considered as an ordinary classical number in quantum mechanics. Now, um, I would say that this is kind of the physics folklore, but those covariant POVMs, I would argue um, in the eighties and nineties were used to really overcome this and, and give a more general notion of a time observable. So I'll comment a little bit more on that in a second. Um, in general, relativity time is a bit different there, right? What we're doing is we have a theory that's describing space, time, and matter on equal footing, namely both as dynamical degrees of freedom. So you don't have some background temporal structure to define your dynamics, but instead you have to do what Einstein did. He says, time is considered measurable by a clock of negligible spatial extent. The time of an event taking place at a point is then defined as the time shown on the clock simultaneous with the event. So for Einstein, really, it's the act of this operational notion of time is what's shown by a clock. Um, and this was really at the time, a sort of a revolutionary idea in physics. And this was noted by Bridgman. Um, he's, you can think of him as sort of the father of modern uh, operationalism. And he wrote this book as uh, the logic of modern physics where he, he pointed out Einstein in seizing on the act of the observer as the essence of the situation is actually adopting a new point of view as to what the concepts of physics should be, namely the operational view. In general, we mean by any concept, nothing more than a, the set of operations. The concept is synonymous with the corresponding set of operations. So here he's, he's giving a new foundation for what the fundamental concepts in, in science and physics should be. Namely, for them to have meaning, we have to tell, 
we have to describe a process to measure them. And that's exactly what Einstein is doing here when he's talking about measuring time as shown what's on the clock. Now, um, things get more complicated when you try and ask, well, what happens to time in quantum gravity? So if we wanted to be sort of the most conservative we could be, let's just take GR and write it in a form that lends itself to applying some quantization rules. And so we might try to do that uh, in the canonical formulation. And if we write down GR in the canonical form, um, our configuration variable is the three metric. So you can think of this as like all possible different spatial geometries. And we can construct a momentum conjugate to it. And then in this canonical form, we can write down um, the, the, the Hamiltonian of the theory. And what we actually find, uh, well, we, we, can, we can construct that Hamiltonian and we find that, well, okay, you can think of this here, it's quadratic in the momentum. So it's like a kinetic term. There's a potential term that depends on this three metric. And there's some possible interaction here between the stress energy of the matter degrees of freedom and the gravitational degrees of freedom. You get three other momentum constraints, but the important point here to note is that this Hamiltonian in GR is actually constrained to vanish. Um, so this presents a problem um, in that if we want to quantize this, we can follow the rules outlined by Dirac. So the way we implement this constraint in the quantum theory is by demanding that the physical states of our theory um, are annihilated by this constraint. So this is the quantum version of this equation here. And then the second step is to impose some dynamics. Namely, we have a Hamiltonian, so we might expect some Schrodinger type equation. But because our physical states of our theory are constrained to vanish now, um, we find that this state that's supposed to describe this three geometry up here and you know, all of the matter degrees of freedom actually doesn't evolve with respect to this, this T here. It's constrained to vanish on account of this. So this leads to this state being frozen in the so-called Wheeler-DeWitt equation in the problem of time, which is basically like, okay, we have this frozen state. It doesn't evolve relative to its Hamiltonian. So how do we recover a notion of dynamics? If you think about it, really, it's not quite surprising because the lesson of general relativity is that there is no preferred background time, right? So if the Hamiltonian of the theory picked out a preferred time with respect to evolve things, right? Well, that would kind of be in, in contrast with uh, the spirit of, of general relativity. So um, what this is really telling you is that there's no preferred background time with respect to which things evolve. So instead, we must recover some sort of internal relational uh, notion of dynamics um, contained within this, this physical state here. Okay, so just to outline my talk, that, that was by way of motivation. What I want to begin with is just talking about what is a clock as a covariant POVM. And then I want to talk a little bit more about how we answer that question in, the term, in terms of Hamiltonian constraints um, and discuss a little bit of what's known as relational quantum dynamics. And then I want to go on and apply uh, both of these parts to discuss this quantum time dilation effect that I, that I spoke about. At the beginning. So the first thing I want to think about is what is a clock? And so a clock or another context or a reference frame is defined by um, this quadruple here. So we have a clock and what do we mean by a physical system and a clock? Well, okay, it's described by some Hilbert space. We're gonna associate it with it some Hamiltonian. There's gonna be some judicial state. You can think of this as like an initial state if you want. And then there's gonna be some time observable that's gonna turn out to be a covariant POVM. And I'll, I'll go through uh, all of these elements um, and explain how they enter this definition of what we mean by a clock. So, you can think of how does, how does just in standard quantum theory, how does time evolution work or how might a clock work is you, you prepare your clock in some state, rho C, and then time passes. And what happens is you can think of this time evolution that I'm writing here as basically encoding the elapsed time tau unitarily into this initial state rho C. So that after some time tau, the state of the clock is rho C of tau. And then the question you want to ask yourself is, well, okay, what observable TC can I measure on row C such that I can best estimate the elapsed time tau? So this really becomes a parameter estimation problem um, to estimate this, this elapsed time tau. And so this question's you know, been well asked in the context of quantum metrology. Um, and it turns out that you might, you know, what would you expect of a, of a physical time observable? Well, I, I think there's two natural properties. You would expect that on average, this time observable should return the, the elapsed time tau, 
right? That seems like a good physical requirement of our time observable. And the second thing is that the variance in a measurement of TC should not um, depend on the time tau you're, you're trying to estimate. Um, so basically these two properties fix this time observable TC here. Um, and like I said, uh, yeah, that, that, that this question of estimating parameters is well studied in the context of topology. So what is this time observable, this TC? Well, it's a POVM, a positive operator value measure that best estimates the elapsed time. So it's a map from a, a group, okay? And these group, the elements of this group label the possible outcome, outcomes indicated by the clock. It's the different times tau that can be shown by the clock. And then with each outcome, you associate an effect operator E of tau. Um, and for simplicity, we're gonna assume these to be just projection operators that we can form in terms of these clock states. So just to remind you what these effect operators are, um, they basically have to give you well-defined probabilities. So they have to be positive, they have to add up nicely, and they have to be normalized. But their role in the theory is really to tell you if you have an observable TC, right, and you wanna know what's the probability that equals the time tau, well, you just use the standard Born rule and you stick in this effect operator here, okay? And what makes this a covariant time observable is the fact that these clock states that are defining these effect operators um, are connected to one another by the unitary generated by the clock Hamiltonian. So if this is the case, if the effect operators satisfy this, we say that this observable TC is covariant with respect to the group generated by the clock Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is kind of the general theory how to go about defining these covariant um, observables, but I wanna just give two concrete examples because you're already familiar with these notions of observable. So um, we can think of what we might call an ideal clock and where in this case, our clock is just equivalent to a particle on the, on the real line. In that case, the Hilbert space is just the space of square integral functions over the real line. Um, so we can just think like a particle on a line. We can, support, we can choose the Hamiltonian to be the momentum operator PC. And then a measurement of time, right? So this momentum operator is just gonna translate this particle along the real line. And so we can think of our clock as basically like measuring position of this particle. And in this case, we all know that these clock states here are like the position eigenkets. Um, and they're all connected to one another um, by the momentum operator. Namely, the momentum operator generates translations in the position, or in this case, the, these clock states, tau here. So in this case, our time observable, it's also a POVM associated with these clock states, but we can actually associate it with a self-adjoint operator, namely the position operator on the real line. Yeah, but you might say, well, okay, Alex, this really isn't a real good clock Hamiltonian, right? It's not bounded from below, you know, um, what's going on there. Well, this is, the powerful, this, is, this is the power of these covariant POVMs, is in fact, they're more general than self-adjoint operators. Um, and they allow you to define a covariant time observable when your Hamiltonian isn't uh, or is bounded below. So you might imagine that your clock's now a qubit. So the Hilbert space is C2 and maybe your, your Hamiltonian is proportional to the poly Z operator. Then you can consider a POVM where the clock states are actually all correspond to all of the points on the equator of the block sphere. So that's what these states are here. And then basically this Hamiltonian here is generating an evolution of this uh, of, of these clock states around, um, around the equator. And so in this case, um, we can't associate this observable with a self-adjoint operator, but rather we can associate it with a POVM and, and construct a well-defined measurement. For it. Okay, so that's everything I wanna say about covariant time observables. They're, they're basically, the, the main point is that um, they're a more general notion of observable described by a POVM um, that is determined by the Hamiltonian uh, and it basically this covariant condition um, specifies what you mean by a, a time observable um, relative to the evolution generated by your clock. Okay, so the next thing I wanna do is I wanna use these covariant POVMs to talk about how we can um, formulate a relational notion of to address that uh, problem of time I introduced in the beginning slides. And the idea is we're gonna have some big state here psi that describes both the system and our clock. And the idea is to recover some internal relational evolution between the system and, and the clock without assuming any background preferred time. So to think about this, what I want you to do is I want you to think about two theories, theory one and theory two. 
And in theory one here, we have a system. And you can think of this as just how we do standard mechanics. We have a system and there's some external time. And we might get, write down some action in terms of some Lagrangian. And then this action here, this time, is that background Newtonian time of Newton. Um, and we could go on and we could vary these equations of motion, get equations of motion and, and get a notion of dynamics from this action. Um, we can also consider another theory, theory two. And in that theory, let's suppose there's a physical system, a clock. Maybe it's this particle on, on the real line. Let's, for simplicity, let's suppose that. Um, and we could have another system here, but there is no background external time. And instead we're gonna write down the theory in terms of this action S prime where now this is an integral over some arbitrary parameter tau. It has no physical significance the way this time parameter t had here. And now we're gonna write a Lagrangian that describes, you know, it's a function of both, you know, the t coordinate uh, and the q coordinate describing our system here and their derivatives with respect to tau. So we have these two theories and the difference is one has an external background time and one does not. But what you'll notice that if you choose this Lagrangian over here, in such a way that it's equal to t dot times this original uh, system Lagrangian over here, then actually, in fact, these actions are equal. You can show that these actions are equivalent by a change of variables. So what we have is you know, the same theory, the same action, but we have two different ontological pictures of what's going on. Namely, we have a preferred background time, and in this one, we do not, or you know, one might argue, depending on how you choose this, that it's hidden here, um, but for, for the purposes, um, Let's consider these different um, sort of ontological pictures of, of what's going on. So like I said before, one could take this action here and um, get a Hamiltonian and write down Hamilton's equations. And you would get, um, you would find out how Q and um, its momentum or the associated momentum would evolve um, with respect to this background time T. But in this theory here, if we were to do the same thing, we actually, we get a Hamiltonian and that Hamiltonian is proportional to this CH. And it turns out that you can show that this, this um, when the equations of motion are satisfied, this CH here, PC, the momentum conjugate to this time coordinate, plus this system Hamiltonian over here is constrained to vanish. So this isn't approximately zero. This is meant as a constraint or when the equations of motion are satisfied. And so, so if you were to take this um, uh, Hamiltonian and um, you know, um, vary it with respect uh, or, or look at the equations of motion and actually you, you arrive at the same thing. Basically it doesn't describe any evolution of these coordinates with respect to this sort of fictitious parameter tau here. We're taking derivatives with respect to. So the point is this is a simpler system where we have a, a constraint, a Hamiltonian constraint, just like GR. And the hope is that we can study quantization here in, in such, such a simple model um, and, and use it to gain insights what, what might look like to tackle the Hamiltonian constraint in GR. Also, it has significant foundational interest if you're trying to formulate a theory of quantum mechanics without assuming any background notion of time. So why do we want to cast in the Hamiltonian form? Well, okay, if we have this system Hamilton apply a well-defined set of quantization rules, Right, and so the idea is, well, how, how does the quantum theory and how does the quantum dynamics look like um, for this theory? Um, but before doing that, I just wanna think a little bit more about the two different ways um, these theories are thinking about dynamics. So theory one, right, and this is the way, you know, we first thought about dynamics is maybe we have Scooby over here. He has some clock and some ruler and he throws a ball. And this ball has some t and h, some position time and some position h. As a, um, and we might have some initial conditions and use these equations of motion to propagate this initial condition forward um, to find out where it is at some later time t prime. But what theory two is telling us um, is giving us a different way to think about dynamics. It's basically saying, well, okay, we have these two, what I'm gonna call partial observables, namely this clock and this ruler. And what dynamics is really about is correlations between these partial observables. Namely, um, I can only say things about what the clock is doing um, when the ball is at some height h. So basically I could tell you the whole story here. I could tell you some initial conditions and some equations of motion, or I could just collect in a big table, all of the correlations between what the clock is doing and what the height of the ball is. These correlations between what I'm gonna call these partial observables. 
And so together, these partial observables form a what we call a complete observable. So this is terminology introduced by uh, Rovelli. Um, and the idea is that we can only ever, in any sort of experiment, we only ever measure these complete observables, these, these basically the, the time, we only ever measure the position of the particle at a specific instant of time. And so what I wanna talk about is really how to describe dynamics in terms of these complete observables that encodes correlations between these partial observables of this clock in this um, system, just if, if you're some, well, yeah, okay. Um, so here now is we have our clock and we have our system and we wanna construct some observable that I'm gonna call F here that encodes an, ob a, a, an observable F when our clock reads the time T. So it's gonna be a specific observable associated with the clock reading a particular outcome tau. So I wanna just quickly sketch how one might construct these. And this observable here is gonna be called a complete or a relational observable. And the idea is as follows. One starts with this partial observable, this time indicated by the clock and evolves it under the flow generated by the constraint. Um, so if this becomes a bit too technical, I apologize. The punchline is really the fact that we get this series expansion down here, but I'll just explain it um, quickly. So we say, okay, well, this is some fictitious parameter, uh, a gauge parameter generated, uh, associated with the flow generated by this constraint. And the idea is that we evolve this, um, this, this observable here tau under the evolution generated by this constraint until it reaches the time tau. And then we can invert this equation and solve for that parameter S. And then the idea is we do the same thing for this observable here F on our system but then we, we evolve it to some point S and then evaluate it at um, the solution to basically the same S such that this value of this observable T is equivalent to the time tau. Okay, so I realize that's a little bit complicated and you might need to think about it in a quiet moment, but the point is we have this observable here that we can write uh, that we associate with F when the clock reads tau and we can write it as this series expansion. Um, where this, okay, this N is this nested Poisson bracket. Okay, so that would be the classical theory. Um, and basically uh, just to say is like, what we would now ask is, okay, if we have the state of our, our system, we evaluate what this observable is at the time tau, and that'll tell us what F's doing when the clock reads. Okay, so that was all the classical theory. And the question is now, how do we go about quantizing such a theory? And, um, the basic idea is we take our, our constraint and we promote it uh, or, um, to operators. And we demand, just like I, I mentioned on the first few slides, we demand that our physical state is annihilated by this constraint here. Um, and so in this case, our, our constraint was PC plus HS. So these get promoted to operators um, and our physical state is gonna satisfy this constraint equation here. In general, we could consider a more general clock Hamiltonian, namely, instead of having PC, we might replace it with HC. And even more general, you know, if we think back to the Hamiltonian constraint of GR, there might be some interaction between the clock and the system. So we might have something that looks like this. Um, but what I want to say here is for the rest of the talk is we're not going to consider any interaction. So we're just going to consider a Hamiltonian constraint that looks something like this, HC plus HS. Um, so that's how we get those physical states. Basically, we have this constraint and we demand that the physical states are annihilated by it. And the other thing we wanna do is quantize these observables that we um, had defined previously. And um, what we were able to show in this recent work with uh, Philip and Max was that the quantization of these, we can do that quantization in terms of those covariant POVMs I, I introduced earlier so that Basically that effect operator associated with the clock reading a particular time T um, basically comes out here. And then that series expansion appears over here where this Poisson bracket now becomes the commutator and we get an I to the N here. And what we were able to show is that this, this quantization of this classical complete or relational observable corresponds to this G twirl over the effect operator associated with the clock reading the time tau with this, this F observable on, on the system. Well, this makes a nice connection with, um, I mean, this G twirl here is defined as this 
this group average over the constraint. Um, but I just want to emphasize that this makes a nice connection with other uh, quantum reference frame literature, um, namely this work of uh, Bartlett, Rudolph, and Speckens, in which the G-twirl there plays a prominent role. Um, OK, so if, if, if this notion of complete and relational Dirac observables uh, or observables was uh, a bit confusing, this is, this is the punchline of that entire construction, is that we have these physical states, and then we can construct these um, this quantization of these relational Dirac observables, namely associated with a system observable A, oops, uh, sorry about that, uh, when the clock reads the time tau. And then the way dynamics arises is that we look at the expectation of this, of this, this observable here um, for a given tau, and that basically tells us what this observable is doing when the clock reads the time tau. And the way the dynamics come out, um, they come out by allowing this parameter tau to run or consider different measurement outcomes of the clock. And we can show that we get, we, we recover a, a notion of dynamics. Um, so this is the story of, of relational, uh, of, of relational um, observables and how one might expect um, a dynamics to come from um, this constraint theory here. Five minute we don't have, sure, five minute warning, wow, okay. Um, all right, so quickly, um, what I'm going to say is that one can also do this in the Page and Wooters formalism. This was an equivalent dynamics. Um, and again, one considers this clock, um, like this particle on the real line, and one can define these clock states in an analogous way here, just as the position eigenkets. And one gets a dynamics um, very, uh, I think, a lot quicker. Basically, the idea is one's going to say the state of the system the joint state of the clock in the system, namely this big physical state, conditioned on the clock being in the state tau. So what one basically does is projects this state, this physical state, onto one in which the clock reads the time tau. And you can think of this as basically the standard state in um, Schrodinger, um, or the standard orthodox quantum mechanics, um, because you can show that it satisfies the Schrodinger equation. Um, so, um, we have an equivalent way of getting dynamics. And a priori, the dynamics one and the dynamics two um, aren't connected and were actually long thought to be distinct. So um, what we were able to do in this work was actually to show an equivalence between these two approaches. And I'm not gonna flush it out in detail. Um, and I'm not gonna flush out its significance. But what I wanna just mention is, is that basically we were able to construct invertible maps between the dynamics defined by the page Wooders formalism here and dynamics defined by this um, back observables. Um, and it turns out that um, independently, there was another framework being put forward um, to get a relational Heisenberg picture, this so-called perspective neutral framework, um, which can gives um, uh, alternative maps between these relational dynamics of these Dirac observables and um, a relational Heisenberg picture analogous to this conditional Schrodinger picture. And it turns out that these two, two ways of thinking about dynamics are unitarily equivalent. Okay, so um, given the short amount of time, I really wanna just get to the punchline here. Um, and maybe I'll go just a little bit into the question period. Um, but the idea is, okay, I've introduced this notion of a covariant time observable and I've introduced this notion of relational dynamics, how we can do dynamics without an external background time. And the question I wanna now ask is, okay, using that formalism, let's ask this question. What is the time dilation of clock A that's moving in some superposition relative to B here? And for simplicity, I'm just gonna assume that this, this clock here is at rest relative to some background inertial frame. So this is, this is the big question here. Um, and the idea is basically to consider some center of mass that has some internal degrees of freedom that are gonna function as a clock. And basically what you can do is you can go through the same cano canonical analysis with an action and construct a constraint. Um, and what you find is that you find a constraint that looks something like this here, where now we're basically have our physical state and we have our P naught um, plus some relativistic Hamiltonian for our particle that now describes both the uh, internal clock degrees of freedom and the center of mass degrees of freedom. And one can now condition, construct a, a conditional or a page Wooters conditional Schrodinger state um, and get, a, get basically this relativistic Schrodinger equation in that way. Um, what one does is basically 
expands this to leading order and one's going to have a Hamiltonian of this internal clock and one associates a proper time observable in terms of these covariant POVMs with that internal clock Hamiltonian. There's a center of mass, this non-relativistic center of mass, and then there's some interaction that couples the center of mass and the clock degree of freedom. And that's basically responsible for the time dilation effect. And so the big, the big thing to look at is now what's the probability that clock A reads the time tau A conditioned on clock B reads the time tau B. And the punchline is if you were to consider this clock A moving in a superposition, you find that the average time read by clock A is no longer just related by this classical gamma factor that one would associate with basically a statistical mixture of these two wave packets, but there's a novel quantum correction to the average time dilation due to this non-classical superposition state um, that it's moving. So you can calculate that average. I'll just, um, the point is for a given average sum of those momentum wave packets, there's an optimal difference in those momentum wave packets that maximizes this gamma Q. And basically what it, it can, this gamma Q, uh, this, this quantum gamma factor can be both positive and negative depending on the nature of the superposition. Now you might say, okay, well, Alex, I don't understand any of this relational dynamics and what's this Page and Wooters formalism. Well, um, I just wanna highlight a talk that's gonna come on April 20th in this series by um, Piotr, Piotrik. Um, he's basically, what we showed is we basically redid this analysis, but we basically just considered the center mass of an atom to be moving in a momentum superposition and considered an internal uh, energy level, an atom to be excited. And what we were able to show was that the correction to the transition rate was exactly what you would expect from this time dilation effect. So basically the punchline here is that this suggests that this other kind of quantum clock that has nothing to do with what I showed before experiences the same quantum time dilation as what I described there. And so we see that in this case, this, this quantum time dilation effect um, might be universal. So this, this supports that conjecture. Um, and I just wanna emphasize if you put things into, um, if you put numbers in with based on what's currently accessible in experiment, um, you might conclude optimistically that we may be able to observe this quantum time dilation effect um, in a near future experiment. I mean, we've been able to create these superpositions um, and we've been able to measure time dilation at very low um, velocities, but the big experimental challenge is basically putting all of these techniques together. So. With that, I'll end there. I'm sorry for going over a bit of time, um, but I'm happy to address any questions and what time there is left. But otherwise, uh, thank you all for, for listening. Hi, thank you very much, Alex. Yes. No all right. Uh, we have uh, some questions. Uh, Rick tells me that uh, Don Page had a question already. I would ask you if you can, please yes. use the, the, the raise hand feature to ask questions because that allows me to see you and I'll, I'm giving you, you know, the, the floor uh, in the order that you ask. But let's begin. I'm going to let uh, you unmute yourself. So Don, do you have a question? You can unmute yourself now. Yes, all very nice talk, but I didn't understand because the two clocks aren't at the same place. How can you say what one clock is doing at the, the time of the other one? How Do you compare them along some null line that you send a signal from one clock to the other? Or how? Right. Um, no, no, that's good. Um, so let me say here. So what we're looking at is, I mean, I would say that this this probability here that you get out, this is analogous to the the classical special relativistic time dilation formula. So that you know how we have um, basically the time dilation in one frame is related to another one by a Lorentz factor. So I would say that this is what this is telling you. So I guess my answer to your question would be, okay, well, I have two observers, they both have their own clocks. They make a bunch of measurements um, and then they get back together and, and compare their clocks um, and see that they're, you know, on average, they're related by this, by this way here. So you might imagine that some observer has access to um, this clock A here and is making measurements and is getting out on average sometime tau B, whereas uh, this observer here is making measurements and getting out tau B. I'm not sure if that addresses the issue, but. Well, would it be, I mean, normally you'd say you have a whole system of clocks everywhere. I mean, you know, the reference frame. Yeah, but, so is that, are you imagining that this B that's the, that's the reference clock or something that's a whole set of them all over the place and then you compare whichever one is at the same location mm -hmm. as, as clock A? 
Yeah, I guess maybe that would be a way to think about it. Maybe I have a whole bunch of clock of clock A systems that are prepared in this, and I make a bunch of measurements and get and get this average out that way. And same thing with B. Um, right. Of course, that might be. Then, of course, the different Bs might be have quantum fluctuations in how fast they run relative to some background thing. So that's that's exactly right. And indeed, because of this momentum spread, there's a there's a variance. There's a non-trivial trivial variance. Um, so I didn't have time to explain that, but you can take that into account in these probability distributions, and that can that can affect um, things here as well. So that's that's a very good point because of that spread. You're right. There's an uncertainty in exactly what time it's measuring. Yeah, that affects the you know like the second moment of this probability distribution, but the first moment, the average would be. Um, I guess the result is that that's unaffected for these wave packets. But that, that's a good point. All right. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Alex. So the next question, uh, Cisco. Uh, hello. Yeah, I like that talk too. Thank you very much for oh. that. Um, I, I was curious about uh, the statements you made about unitary equivalence and yes. uh, the relation between these uh, uh, quantum reference frames works, this holy trinity business. Yeah. As far as I yeah. know, that has only been worked out for uh, non-general relativistic systems so i would say and the um, unitary equivalence breaks down in any general relativistic uh application of these so has that right. problem been solved or has, so, okay, has that been so absorbed into this you're, you're very correct to point out that so far this equivalence has only been established in simple models where we don't have any interaction and um the first paper that we did um just considered non-degenerate uh clock hamiltonians so the Hamiltonian constraint was still like analogous to be linear in the momentum, um, but uh, um, it could be bounded from above or below. And so we generalized, or we showed that in that case. And then we wrote another paper that generalized it to relativistic systems that had a quadratic clock Hamiltonian. Um, so this was like the case of that relativistic. Um, so this does consider some relativistic models, like the special relativistic um, you know, P squared plus M squared dispersion relation or some mo models in cosmology. Um, and the basic, the difference there is you have degeneracies, um, but one can still establish an equivalence in that case. So it does take into account relativistic systems. And now I know there's people working on- um, Special relativistic, right? Yes, sorry. I mean, not, you're right. So, there's, no, there's no field theory, infinite degrees of freedom going on. I think that's an open problem that lots of people are thinking about. So fair enough, that's, I mean, that hasn't been established. Um, there, is uh, there a hope to ever even solve that problem because I mean, the unitary inequivalence of different quantizations Oops. based on different coordinate choices, doesn't that post kind of an immovable roadblock to this program? Right, well, I would say, okay, so you're touching on like really sort of foundational open problems and how you want to go about quantizing GR, right? Like, do you want to, do you want to identify time first at the classical level and then create a quantization? Or do you want to quantize everything first and then identify some time later? So I feel like in the absence of experiments, we have sort of some choice depending on your philosophical preference. Um, so there's been lots of sort of reviews discussing that choice. And basically you're exactly right to point out that choosing in, in general, choosing a time before quantizing and then choosing a time after quantizing or basically choosing different ways to reduce your theory um, you know, to these different um, relational pictures. Um, it's not clear in general what the right one is or what the wrong one is, or what you have lots of choices to make here is what I'm trying to say. Um, okay. And so depending there's still on the what freedom. You so you're saying, well, I mean, I mean um, in, in what sense in principle, do you mean freedom? I, I mean, there's still a, a possible avenue depending on where, where you philosophically want to choose uh, when I to would quantize say, yeah, the there's clock. There's multiple quantization schemes you might want to employ, call constrained system. Um, that emphasize different different things that you like to think about. That's how I would. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll save any more questions for. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Yeah, no, good questions. Good question. Okay. Thank you, Cisco and Alex. Uh, next question is Rob. Rob. Yeah. Hi, Alex. Uh, hi, Rob. Interesting talk. What happens to quantum time dilation if the clocks are entangled? That's a good question. Um, I mean, so I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure. So oh, where am I here? Um, yeah, 
so the, the idea would be here that these two clocks would be maybe entangled in some way. So I guess here, the idea that we had in mind is, well, okay, we have some sort of classical interpretation of these wave packets, right? And the first, you know, as sort of a particle moving with some average momentum. Um, and so the first relativistic time dilation within this formalism, and if one doesn't have that superposition, one can recover the, the special uh, relativistic result. So then the next natural thing was to ask, okay, well, if it's in a superposition, I mean, um, I have hard enough time explaining what a superposition is, you know, being simultaneously moving at two speeds at once. Um, but then, and so that's taking some sort of quantum possibility, but then you're right, one could in principle ask, okay, well, you know, how does this time dilation now uh, depend on any entanglement shared between? That's another possibility that's allowed for um, by the theory. So uh, I'm not sure exactly off the top of my head what would, what would happen. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just, it seems to me it's an interesting question to ask given what you've done. Right, right. I just, I guess then if there is entanglement, I just wonder to what extent these sort of can be considered independent clocks in some sense that to be- Well, to okay, be or, or clock A, entangled with clock C and ask what clock B thinks or something. There's a number yeah. of ways of doing it, right? Yeah, yeah, no, so that's- You're right, uh, I mean, maybe time doesn't mean anything under some circumstances, I don't know. But it'd be, yeah. uh, as soon as I see a superposition, I think of entangling, so. Right, no, 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 that's, that's yeah, that's spot on. Okay, thank you very much, Rob and Alex. Uh, next question is Albert, Albert, you can, Yes, uh, so a couple of questions. One was related, but also in connection with what uh, um, uh, Rob was saying. Uh, yes. So one thing I was going to point out is that, you know, it was implicit, but you didn't really uh, go or mention that, is that once you quantize this clock, it's a quantum mechanical degree of freedom, then yeah. you can have superpositions as you discuss here, but then you can also have interference effects. And so you can yeah. have interference of these clocks. And yeah. that, among other things, would also offer one example of uh, looking at effects of because in this clock interferometer, where you have a superposition of the clock, you know, experiencing different time dilations, but then eventually recombining and reading out the interference signal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, if you started, for example, with certain entangled states, you could start, you could generate a noon state uh, mm -hmm. for your clock with several entangled clocks. And mm -hmm. that would translate, for example, in an improvement in the uh, precision that you would have in the interference signal of this clock interferometry if you use entangled clocks, just, just as an example of uh, clock entanglement uh, in connection with this interferometry and clock interferometry. Right. I mean, that's a that's a that's a good point. I mean, is that um, you're right in, in a, the metrology context, noon states are sort of used to, you know, as you make bigger and bigger noon states, you can usually measure things better. Um, and so, in an interferometry experiment, I presume. Yeah, um, that that would be correct. That you might be able to um, see or uh, give the work of uh, Magdalena and uh, Igor Pukowski and uh, Chaslav and um, yeah, but So we also we also discuss yeah. this uh, how to implement that uh, with with uh, you know with right. I know you have a paper as, as well and, too. And yeah. are, I mean, I guess the point I want to just make a distinction there is in those in those um, interferometer experiments, you're ultimately looking at um, uh, how the visibility of an interference pattern at the end, and that visibility pattern, how visible that that interference pattern is. Um, gives you a signature that basically the different arms of the interferometer experience different time dilations. Here it's a little bit different is that we're actually looking at a time observable of the system. Perhaps there's a way to relate that visibility to the time dilation that's observed maybe a, yeah, a off the top yeah, of my head. I, mean, I would expect to probably relate. Is. In fact, there's a different way of reading out which is better than looking at the visibility because it's easier to measure and you're right. more sensitive to that. And then it's really, it's, you know, a differential measure for the different internal states when you build a specific model of the clock. And in that way, you can read out the time, uh, so, the different time dilations directly from, from your Okay, So I haven't, I haven't seen it formulated in that way. I mean, I just want to emphasize the point here of the work is to construct a covariant POVM on this internal degree of freedom that tracks, say, like the decay rate of an atom or something like that. That's kind of the picture we had in mind, not necessarily mm -hmm, mm -hmm, recombining mm -hmm. these paths, just basically making a measurement um, of what we call the time observable um, associated with this internal degree of freedom. Um, 
Um, but I agree, there's certainly similarities um, in spirit and certainly that, that work was an inspiration for thinking about this question here, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, I also brought, brought it up in, 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 in connection with uh, Rob's question in the sense that that would be then an example, as I just mentioned, where then you can think of a particular effect of entanglement, which is familiar, is comparable to things that we are already familiar uh, with in other contexts, right. like the noon states, for example. But yes, but then I had also another just brief question. I had the impression, but maybe you can comment on that or confirm uh -huh. that, that the method you were using to define uh, your time, this mathematical uh -huh. method, it reminded me a lot of what in the context of uh, um, some quantum gravity approaches, but also more generally for constrained systems is called sometimes the, uh, the, 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 the group averaging method. Yes, yes. No. Quantization. So it reminded me a lot. I mean, it, do you agree that that's- A hundred percent. I didn't say group averaging or anything like that, um, but you're right. These physical states here, I mean, it's exactly that. These physical states here are constructed by basically projecting or a coherent group average over the group generated by the constraint. Um, and then this G twirl I introduced here is basically again, but it's it's an incoherent group average. So um, it, it's not like this projector or this delta function of the constraint where you just wouldn't have this here. It's consistent with group averaging. Um, and basically within that context, that's where these relational Dirac observables um, mm -hmm. have, have been studied. So you're exactly right, yep. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Albert and, uh, and Alex. Um, I have one more question and had yes. many questions, but but mon many of them have been very interestingly formulated already. Have a one, one little one. Uh, what about what would happen if I have a room temperature uh, clock? And by that I mean, I mean, uh, I have a clock that I allow to have the coherence with an environment, so I'll have a mixed state in that place in, instead of a coherent superposition. So momentum would be now a classical statistical distribution. You would imagine that that shouldn't affect in the same way, the definition of time or something, but what do you know? Can you tell me what would happen in that case? Or yeah, 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 exactly. So, uh, okay, so, well, you mentioned a few things. So one, I, I, okay, so like instead, so I guess there's two ways to answer that question or two, okay, let me ask a clarifying question. Do you mean like what happens if I have some environment and I have some interaction and then there's slowly coupling and information's leaking yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, the like, two sides are very good. So first, what happens if you couple to an environment and you have the coherence? Second, what ha what, what is the meaning of having a statistical, classical statistical yes. distribution of clocks? Yeah, they're yes, related, okay. but they're different questions, yeah. Okay, so let's, so, okay, the first one about an environment, okay, well, I mean, that's getting complicated. Let's assume the interactions are small. That's kind of what we're doing here. Um, you can ask an interesting philosophical question. What does it mean operationally if we can never insulate a clock from an environment? What does that do for you? So you can play those games. That's interesting, I agree. Um, but then your question about the statistical mixture, well, I think we can just think of it sort of the way uh, Don had brought up at the beginning um, was um, what if instead of a superposition here, you just have a statistical mixture of a bunch of clocks. And what you find is that because now this gamma Q it's proportional to this cosine of the relative phase between these wave packets. So this gamma Q is gonna to go to zero. So that's how we know oh, that it's not yeah. gonna manifest in, in, in the statistical mixture. In the statistical mixture case, what just a statistical mixture weighted by the weights of the superposition, cosine squared and sine squared of, cla of just classical special relativistic time dilation. So that's kind of same, the, the, the um, interpretation that uh, Don put forward where, okay, I have a bunch of clocks, make a bunch of measurements. Sometimes I get one time dilation, sometimes I get another. Right. So just, just one comment, Eduardo. I mean, in a sense, uh, and really taking the operational point of view uh, seriously, our best time is like that. It's an incoherent, I mean, not exactly, but it's, it's really an incoherent time because it's this universal time coordinate. It comes from the international atomic time, you know, and yep. different atomic clocks in the world, uh, you know, they measure and then they perform an average, which varies the weight. Of course, one difference compared to just the point that was being considered here is that there you do correct you know, for this uh, special relativistic and general relativistic time dilation effects, which are different for the different clocks. So that when you build up, is universal time, you know, it's still a sort of statistical, it's an incoherent mixture, but you have corrected, uh, you know, individually for each one of these members that contribute to this, uh, you know, statistical quantity uh, by its different time dilation in, in terms of special relativistic and general relativistic, so that right. it makes sense to uh, take. But op from an operational point of view, that's the, the best time that we use in, you know, experimental physics is in fact uh, of that sort. Yep, I agree, I fully agree. 
I just want to quickly add. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just I just want to say um, one can you might consider an interaction. So like the idea here is now okay. You have your clock in your system. There's sort of two ways you can consider interactions. Maybe you have the clock coupled to the system whose dynamics you want to track, or maybe you just have your clock coupled to some other environment. Right. There's sort of two possibilities. We I just want to say we took a look at this, and the punchline is you get a, a this kind of interaction between the clock and the system which would be relevant for say GR where, cause you do can't ever separate those things. Um, and what you basically get is this modified Schrodinger equation. Um, so I won't go into it, but um, you, you can look at it. Uh, right. uh, I'm gonna con keep, sure. keep uh, I'm, I'm supposed to be the one who keeps this uh, more or less in time. So, but yes. uh, super, super interesting talk, Alex. And uh, so many questions come to mind. Thank you very much. Let's thank Alex again. Thanks a lot Eduardo. All right. So I'm gonna pause uh, while the next speaker prepares. Pause the recording. All right, our next speaker for the session is Flaminia Giacomini, uh, the postdoc at Perimeter Institute for, for Theoretical Physics. Uh, Flaminia, uh, you have 20 minutes, and uh, same as other speakers, you can if you need uh, to bite a little bit into the question time if necessary, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, allowing me to present this work here. So this is recent work with Chaslab. And the, so I'm not going to talk about clocks, but we're not going very far because we're still going to talk about quantum reference frames and in particular, how uh, we can use them to generalize Einstein's equivalence principle. So the Einstein equivalence principle is uh, one of the fundamental principles of GR and in particular, it encodes the metric structure of the theory. But on the other hand, it is also a very useful experimental tool in order to test alternative theories, and in particular in connection with the uh, metric structure. So uh, it, it has been uh, tested extensively, and there are experiments that uh, test it more and more precisely. However, there are some regimes in which we do not know whether it's going to hold or not. And what I'm thinking about, for instance, uh, is uh, quantum systems that gravitate. What do I mean? So we can have a mass that we can put in a special superposition and uh, this mass is the source of a gravitational field. And in this case, uh, we, so we, uh, we have no classical space time. And in particular, we do not know whether the Einstein equivalence principle can be um, is still valid in uh, this situation. Whatever we're going to find is going to be interesting because if it's valid, then uh, we have some elements that we can retain in the generalization of our theory. While if it's violated, then this can point us to elements that you have to modify when we generalize our theory to these type of situations. So more precisely, the uh, statement of the Einstein equivalence principle can be formulated as follows. Let us take a manifold and let us take an, an arbitrary point P in what the Einstein equivalence principle tells us is that it is possible to take a coordinate transformation which casts the metric at the point P, so locally, uh, as the Minkowski metric, and also the first derivative of the metric vanishes at that point. And we call this new coordinate system that we define a local inertial frame. Another th um, element of GR that we're going to use is the principle of relativity, which in the statement that Einstein gave of it implies general covariance. And in particular, it states that physical laws are formulated in terms of spatial temporal coincidences. So uh, to go a little bit more into the details of what the uh, Einstein equivalence principle uh, tells us, uh, let us uh, review uh, quickly what, uh, how we build a local inertial frame. And in order to do this, this we can uh, consider a manifold, uh, which, uh, which has some coordinates x. And let, let us consider also a point xp. So now the, we, can, uh, we want to change coordinates from x to this coordinate psi, which will be the coordinates of our uh, local inertial frame. And this is a map, and we can tailor expand this map about the uh, position xp. In particular, we're only going to consider linear terms because this is all we need for the statement of the Einstein equivalence principle. And this is going to be important in what follows. And uh, let us consider now the first order coefficients of this Taylor expansion. And so this is a four by four matrix. So we have 16 free parameters that we're uh, totally free to choose when changing the coordinates. 
And uh, GR tells us how the metric field changes when we uh, change coordinates. In particular, if we only care about the metric field at the location X, at the point XP, then we can just evaluate uh, this zero. And we find these matrices that were the first order expansion of our coordinate change. So now, in order to fully determine this metric, we have to fix 10 quantities because the metric field is symmetric. So basically, this means that we can use 10 of these 63 parameters in order uh, to set the metric to Minkowski at the point uh, xi equal to zero, which is the center of our local inertial frame. And then we will have higher order corrections uh, in the neighborhood of this point. Um, so to summarize, we can see this as a two-step procedure. First, we uh, go to the relative coordinates to this point xp, x minus xp. And then we stretch the metric such that it's Minkowski at the uh, location of, at the origin of the local inertial frame. So now, um, this holds if, uh, if we consider reference frames as abstract entities, so just uh, like an abstract coordinate system. But Einstein himself, in the formulation of GR, uh, actually took an operational view of reference frames and he described them as rods and clocks. And we know that rods and clocks are physical systems and hence they're quantum systems which can display superposition and entanglement. So uh, while if we have a classical system, we can uh, formulate, we can describe a classical system in space time as a classical world line, uh, then if we want to consider physical systems, this picture is not um, uh, sufficient. But we have to replace this with something more like this. So with a quantum system, which has a wave function in space and time. And also, since we also want to consider uh, the possibility for space time to be non-classical, we also some space time that is not classically well-defined. So superpositions of space times that we are going to use in order to address this question uh, are quantum reference frames. And in particular, the, this formulation that we gave together with the Stephen and Charles lab. And so the, the core, I, I don't have time to uh, explain to you the, this formulation, but the, I, I'll just give you a few elements to, to get an intuition of what is going on. So this is a relational formulation, according to which we uh, only describe the relational quantities to some quantum systems. In particular, we can take an initial reference frame, C, uh, that uh, describes a quantum system A and a quantum system B. And here in particular, I depicted this uh, quantum system A as in a superposition of two sharp positions, X1 and X2. So uh, what this uh, formalism for quantum reference frames allows you to do is to take the perspective of this quantum system by generalizing the usual reference frame transformation by applying uh, for instance, a uh, superposition of special translations. So this means that we are going to apply the translation to this system, quantum system B in a coherent superposition. So in quantum information language, we will treat this B system as a target system and the A system as the controlled system, which controls the amount by which we are translating. What we get if we do this is that from the perspective of A, we are describing systems B and C, remember, always relational quantities. So if C describes A and B, uh, A describes B and C. And the uh, uh, quantum state of B and C is entangled from the point of view of A, where we started from a product state. But the relative distances are um, all, um, is what we would intuitively get if we put ourselves in the position X1 or X2. And this is just going to be coherently superposed to get an entangled state. So that's a very short summary of the ideas that are here. And what I want you to remember is that we are going to apply a coherent superposition of classical reference frame transformations, um, which is controlled on the state of the quantum reference frame. So this allows me to formulate the, our generalization of the Einstein equivalence principle which is that for every quantum state of a system P living in a superposition of classical space times, one can find the quantum local inertial frame transformation to the quantum reference frame of P, such that the metric is locally Minkowski at the origin of the quantum reference frame. So here we are introducing this quantum local inertial frame, which as we will see, um, 
basically uh, forces us to generalize the transformation to a local inertial frame to a quantum reference frame transformation. So what we will need in the following is a gravitational field G, um, a, metric, a test particle M that surveys the gravitational field. And in particular, we're going to use it to extract information about the gravitational field and a particle P that serves as a quantum reference frame. So let's see more in depth what these, uh, um, um, what these three elements are. So let's start with the description of a quantum system in space time. So this is already a non-trivial step, but there is a meaningful way in which we can introduce a representation on space time. So this X here is a space time uh, coordinate, so three plus one. Uh, and the, the, this quantum state is covariant. So this is a covariant representation of a quantum system in space time, which has some spread. On the other hand, we also need to introduce a description of a superposition of gravitational fields. So of course, we know that the, there is no full theory to describe this situation, so we're going to make a few assumptions. We're going to consider a set of manifolds, m1, m2, m3, up to m n. Each one of these manifolds there is a classical gravitational field, G1, G2, G3, and so on. So these are just classical solutions, the ones that you would have in GR. And now we are going to associate a cat to each one of these classical solutions. And the assumption that we're going to make is that uh, each classical configuration is macroscopically distinguishable from another one. So G1 and G2 and G3 are macroscopically distinguishable and also that we can apply the principle of linear superposition of standard quantum mechanics. So the last thing that we have to explain is the, uh, this particle M, what the, what the role of the particle M is. So for this, let, let us first uh, imagine what happens if we have a test particle M in classical GR. So here we will have a particle with some word line, and then at some point, uh, so at some, for some value of the affin parameter on, along the word line, we can identify some coordinates in the coordinate system that we're choosing. And um, so and at this point, we can associate a value of the gravitational field. So there is some classical correlation between the uh, value of the metric field at some point along the word line of the system and the value of the gravitational field. So here, I want to stress that I'm not proposing a way to measure the gravitational field. I know that this is a much harder task. I'm only saying that we need a physical system in order to have information about the metric. So now, uh, the step that we have to do is to promote this M to a quantum system in space-time with the discovering formulation of quantum systems in space-time that I have introduced in the previous slide. And in this case, we will have a different type of correlation uh, between M and the gravitational field, and we will write it in this way. So uh, this is not a classical correlation, but for every possible value of XM, then there will be an associated value of the gravitational field at the location of this quantum system. So uh, this is a, a way to say that the metric field correlates with the coordinates of M in this quantum way. So now uh, let me uh, get to the statement of, so, so to show you that uh, how we generalize the Einstein equivalence principle to this situation. And in order to do that, let's consider the most general uh, situation that we can have. So let's take these three manifolds. So we can have n manifolds here, just represented three of them, m1, m2, m3, with a gravitational field g1, g2, and g3 for each one of these manifolds. And then we're going to have the system M that is correlated with the gravitational field in the way that I've shown you in the previous slide. And uh, finally, we have the system P and uh, which also lives in this superposition of manifolds and P is going to be our quantum reference frame, which will define our quantum local inertial frame. So uh, another thing that I would like to stress is that the quantum system of P and M on each one of these manifolds are, these are totally independent one from the other. So in principle, we have no relation between them. And we can just define them as a superposition. 
and we will see how. And uh, I've, I've already mentioned that the key in order to uh, obtain this uh, generalization is to generalize the local inertial frame transformation. And uh, in order to do that, we are going to apply the principle of mirror superposition twice, once within the same space time, because the position of P is in a superposition of space time uh, positions. Uh, we have to apply the uh, transformation to a local inertial frame in a way that is coherently controlled on the position of P. And the second time is across different space times, because for each space time, we have a different metric, P, hence a different uh, transformation to the local inertial frame. I only have five minute warning. Yeah. So, um, it, okay. So let's recall that uh, we had the, uh, when we Taylor expanded the, re, re, the coordinate transformation to a local inertial frame, we had these 16 free parameters that were free to choose. Here we have exactly the same situation, but we have to choose a different parameter for each point xp and e each space time gi. So we will have basically a different matrix fi for uh, each xp and for each gi. But once we accept this, everything flows naturally because uh, the, the metric field will change consistently with each uh, matrix Fi that we define. And we're also going to evaluate the metric field at, Z, at, the, at the origin of our quantum local inertial frame. And this will allow us to fix these 10 quantities, which will be different at ex, for each XP and for each GI. So let's see more concretely what uh, happens. And let's start by considering a single classical and current spacetime. So we uh, have uh, the system P that serves as the quantum reference frame, which is described as this, uh, um, uh, as a covariant uh, quantum state in spacetime. And then we have the system M that is our probe particle, which is correlated with the value of the metric field, as I said before. And um, so, uh, and then we have to choose a different transformation for each point xp at which the particle is defined. And remember that we had this two-step procedure to reach of the reference frame and then to uh, straighten the coordinates. So, how are we going to do that? So, forget for a minute that we have this integral here in d4xp, and let's focus on a single xp. So for a single XP, the procedure is totally well-defined by GR. What we do is we, we know that for XP, we will have a transformation that has this, this structure, basically. And I, want, I would like you to notice that this transformation is linear in XM. So this means that we can write it as a unitary transformation on the system M. And now what we have to do is we have to coherently control on each coherently control it on each value of xp by choosing a different transformation for each possible xp. And, but this is, again, we just have to extend the Hilbert space on which this transformation acts to the system P, but it's still going to be a unitary transformation. But it's going to be a transformation that is quantum controlled on the system P. So uh, what happens if we generalize uh, this to uh, a superposition of space-time? Well, this is going to be the second time we apply the quantum superposition principle. And basically, the state is the same for each. Uh, so we will have a, a state of P and the state of M for each possible classical manifold. And then we're going to linearly superpose the states of P and M for each uh, manifold. And this is going to give us the, the full state. And uh, the strategy is the same, but here we have to choose a different transformation for at each point xp and for each gi, and, but, and still we have this two-step procedure to center the origin and straighten the coordinates. So uh, like before, we can just fix the uh, i, uh, so we can just fix one i, one single manifold, and one xpi. We will have a unitary transformation for the same reasons that I described before, uh, but this time we have to control the transformation not only on the position of the system P, but also on the specific GI that I have in each possible manifold. And this is going to give me a different transformation for each possible manifold. But again, this is a unitary transformation. It's just that we have two controls here. One is P 
and one is uh, M, is uh, G. Um, so the last thing that uh, we have to check now is that what, what happened, so how to check that uh, this is locally Minkowski. So what we do is we uh, transform the state, the full state to the log quantum local inertial frame with this transformation that we have defined. And then uh, we want to probe the metric at the origin of this quantum local inertial frame. And um, the way we're going to do that is by using a von Neumann procedure. And uh, so it's a, this is just a, a standard measurement scheme in quantum mechanics and where we couple the position of P to the momentum of this uh, ancillary system that we, that we use. And then we measure it in X equal to zero, well, Xi equal to zero in this case, uh, for the ancilla, which basically for, so this procedure basically is forcing the ancilla to look at the origin of the quantum reference frame of the well quantum reference frame uh, p. So um, what we get if we do this is that uh, the metric field is Minkowski at the location of the quantum reference frame, so at the origin of the quantum local inertial frame. And then we will have some deviations of it from it, which are also in a quantum superposition because we started with a quantum superposition of gravitational fields uh, when, we are, when we go to the neighborhood of this quantum local inertial frame. So that's all I wanted to tell you. And let me just recap what, uh, what I said. So this is also a generalization of the formalism for quantum reference frames to curve space times and superpositions of space times. And that we have introduced here the notion of quantum local inertial frame. And I gave you the statement that I'm not going to reread, but I'll, I'll leave it here for you, of the generalization of the Einstein equivalence principle to uh, this superposition of quantum uh, of, um, of uh, gravitational fields and to quantum reference frames. And uh, so, and what I've, I've shown here is only, so at, at this level, the quantum sta state of P is a frozen state because we didn't have any dynamics enforced, but uh, actually we can also uh, uh, enforce, so we can also add some dynamics of this uh, quantum state and we can consider a quantum system that is freely falling in the gravitational field and in the superposition of gravitational fields and we're still going to find the same result for this system and well that's all thank you for your attention i'm happy to take questions thank you very much flaminia I'm going to ask uh, everybody to use the raise hand uh, feature or uh, if you can't for some reason find it, uh, again, signal uh, Rick, Rick will be looking. I don't see any questions so far. Ah, yes, Cisco. Um, I, I was curious, uh, very nice talk. I was wondering um, if matter states can be incorporated and whether they just come along for the ride or whether it breaks the unitary structure of the transformations. Sorry, by mother states, you mean states that- So the, presumably we don't just have only space times and no matter. No, no, but the system P and M, these are, these are matter. Are they generating the space time? No, uh, not necessarily, no. Okay, so that's the, the, I'm talking about matter states that are actually curving and okay. you know, producing, okay. producing the space time. Uh, so for this, uh, I think it could be a bit more complicated, especially because I wouldn't know how to attribute, um, so how to write the space time at the location of these states. So this would be the, the main problem that I see. Uh, so like how to write the solution of the gravitational field that these states generate uh, at their location. So I wouldn't know how to go do, to- Do you need the to have the solution? Uh, well, I so the, the, what we're assuming here is that we have a gravitational field that is a, a classical state. And uh, so I would assume that I would have to write the state of such a uh, gravitational field uh, associated to a matter configuration. And, but then, I mean, so the first step I would do is not to go to the quantum reference frame of the system that is generating the space-time. 
the, the space time solution basically because i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't know how to how to jump to the quantum reference frame of a system that is generating the space time i don't know if that was clear oh, yeah yeah okay uh, just does this only apply to vacuum space times then in its current no, form? No, no, the space, so say uh, I'm not putting in, say that the source of the gravitational field is far away from the region of space time that we're considering. Yeah. So okay. we don't associate a Hilbert space to, to this matter, to this matter states. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Cisco Familia. Uh, Rick uh, sent a private message that has a question. Rick, you go next and I'll be after. Uh, Familia, thank you so much for the, the talk. The, the idea is very interesting. Uh, I, I just like to understand a little bit better the, the role that the superposition of space times plays in this in this whole uh, um, idea. So uh, were there previous works that studied this uh, equivalence principle in a given fixed space time before that? And if so, what is the difference between considering uh, a superposition of space times and just a fixed space time and then applying the quantum? superposition idea to the test particle P and M essentially. So, okay, so uh, first, the, the, the last question, you can you can also just consider a single space time. So there's nothing that uh, forces you to consider the superposition of space times and the results hold both for a single space time and for the superposition of space times. And then uh, of course, yes, there were uh, works uh, like previous work studying the uh, uh, the, the equivalence principle in different contexts with quantum systems. Uh, I think that what we're, uh, what we're doing here is uh, though a bit different because we are taking the perspective of a quantum system. And so to the best of my knowledge, this was not done before. This, this has been done for quantum systems, but from an, outside, an external perspective or for internal degrees of freedom. So there is this uh, quantum equivalence principle uh, that from Magdalena and Chaslav. Uh, where they were testing the effect that the internal degrees of freedom contributing to the mass uh, were having on the equivalence principle. So of, of course there were works, uh, like there's I think a lot of work that is trying to see the interface of quantum mechanics and gravity in terms of the equivalence principle, but uh, this is a slightly different perspective when we're trying to substitute the reference frame from which we're testing the equivalence principle with quantum systems. Okay, well, thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, next question, Albert. Yes, thank you. Um, I had a question about the, uh, since I'm not very familiar with the details of the, uh, this quantum reference uh, formalism, in particular applied to, to space times as you use it here. Um, um, so, but maybe let me try first to explain how my, my understanding to them perhaps better formulate the question in the sense that the, the relational approaches that I was used to was something along the lines of what Alex presented before, where you have a three plus one splitting and you have a sort of canonical approach. You have your state on a given slice of time and then you have all these issues that he explained. You can use an additional uh, degree of freedom, your clock, and then you have a set of position correlations as he nicely explained. You could use maybe an approach where you consider the full space time a more covariant approach in, in the sense of uh, space time covariant, but then it would be in terms of quantum histories, not so much states. And then going back to what you use, which was states that involve a superposition of different space time points, uh, the part that I have trouble understanding is precisely that the superposition of not just different, you know spatial or certain slices, but really a region in space-time. In the following sense, I could take, just to understand this, a simple case where I have, you know, just a given uh, fixed space-time rather than a superposition of different fixed space-times. And then I, I know how to quantize systems there. I can do quantum field theory and curve space-time for a given fixed background. Uh, but then, you know, if I had, you know, my state on some uh, Cauchy hypersurface that would evolve in time, but then it's not clear to me how I should understand these states that you consider, which were a superposition of, uh, you know, a compact region of, of, of space time, uh, of different space time points, and how that would be compatible with the dynamical evolution that you would have otherwise in this, uh, that you would get, for example, from quantum field theory and curve space time. So, okay. what is the, the interpretation of this 
states which are a superposition of different space-time points? And how does it relate to standard things like quantum field theory and curve space-time if you have a single background? Yeah, okay, so, um, Okay, so actually Alex Stolk will help me to answer this question because so he showed this uh, um, this triangle of three different approaches to relational dynamics that uh, and this uh, which are equivalent and actually uh, so the formalism for quantum reference frames that um, that I'm using so let's take a step back and let's just go to just Galileo and quantum mechanics uh, so that one is actually one of the three points of the tri of that triangle that Alex showed so not in the, the original formulation that is the one that I refer to in in the, in the slides but in, uh, in in a subsequent paper we actually defined the so we actually were able to reconstruct uh, one of the transformations that we had, but also the others can be reconstructed from this uh, perspective neutral approach. Uh, that Alex was talking about. Uh, so in particular, uh, you can uh, basically define a model with some global symmetry, global translational symmetry. And then there is a procedure which allows you to take one perspective or the other perspective. So the quantum reference frame approach that uh, I was referring to is uh, the basically that framework where all the redundancy has already been fixed. And basically you can skip going to the this perspective neutral structure that is the, the the global one and like yeah and it is no perspective uh, and just go from one reduced perspective of one quantum reference frame to the other reduced perspective of another quantum reference frame so actually this this formalism that I um, that, that I'm using here is uh, at least in the Galilean version is full to the standard relational uh, approach that uh, is used in other contexts like uh, quantum gravity or and it can in this this has been shown and uh, so for what concerns the space-time uh, picture so this is actually also uh, so we built on um, what so there is some work by Carlo Rovelli and collaborators that is sometimes referred to as covariant quantum mechanics, where you can just reformulate the uh, free, so you can use the Galilean uh, free, uh, free particle, or you can also do the relativistic particle in terms of uh, a constraint. So in the Klein-Gordon sense, this would be uh, say P0 squared minus P squared uh, if, equal to zero if it's massless, and you can also add the mass term. And uh, and this is basically the this would correspond to the one particle sector of a more general field theory, and and this can be written as uh, uh, as a particle that obeys a constraint. And but you basically add this redundancy, and then you write it as a quantum state in space and time. And the the sense in which we are introducing these covariant states, I didn't have time to explain it, but. It, it's in the paper, is exactly that one. So we we add this red, we add this redundancy. Uh, in addition, we we have a gravitational field. So the, this makes things a bit more complicated. We have to choose a file ordering and and so on. But the idea is basically the same. Um, and uh, and by adding this redundancy, we have a description of these quantum states in space and time. But this is actually. Uh, equivalent to just uh, enfor then enforcing the constraint and to get the physical solution that is just the, the one that one would expect. Okay, so then if I understood correctly, uh, but then it would seem that if in this, you know, maybe this reparameterization invariant way of doing uh, otherwise, uh, you know, quantization of a single relativistic particle in the regime where, where, where that is a good approximation in, in your space time then that would mean that you cannot choose freely, uh, if I understand correctly, these uh, you know, states which are a superposition of different uh, space-time points, and, and especially as far as the time direction is concerned, because you really have the dynamics there, what you would, in a different maybe uh, representation, which is not uh, reparameterization invariant, would correspond to the usual sort of time evolution or dynamics. So in, in that respect, for example, it would seem, I'm not sure whether you really exploited that in your discussion of the quantum equivalence principle, but that in general, you cannot uh, specify so simply uh, a localized region of space-time, localized not just in space, but especially also in time. Yeah, but- uh, Finite uh, region of time. You would need to do something maybe like what uh, uh, Chris Huster was mentioning, that you would need several fields then interacting so that then they select 
uh, a particular region of space-time, but just with a single uh, particle, so to speak, you would not be able to localize in space and time in a small right. region. In time, so, right? okay, uh, yeah. So the, what I've shown here first is uh, the state of, uh, without before enforcing the evolution. And then as I, as I mentioned in my last slide, we also have it when we enforce the evolution. So basically this would be like preparing an initial state if you want, which is not then subject to any dynamics, but fine, one, one can also add the, the dynamical constraint and then find the full uh, uh, history. And uh, actually, uh, thank you for this question because this gives me the occasion to, to say that this particle M that I introduced is basically what the physical system, I mean, it's what gives us the coincidence of these two physical systems that are P and M, and which actually allows us to define meaningfully the coincidence and the space, basically the, the value of the metric at, as, at, at the point that is basically the coincidence between M and P. So this is exactly the role of M, what you're mentioning. Okay, so that's the way you would then localize a yeah. region of space yeah. time. Because in some sense, right, I mean, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, so uh, thank you, Adrian, for many. There's uh, we have one. Let's do one more question. That Rob, it was waiting there. Yeah. Hi, Flaminia. Can you go back to the concluding slide, please? Yes. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I want to see what's on it. Um, uh, okay. So I just wondered a couple of limitations. I gather. This is uh, for a bipartite superposition. Like, what if you have multiple superpositions? Is this still all going to go through okay? A set of n particles. Rob? I think Rob may have lost. Rob? Uh, I think Rob may have lost connection. I know that because there was a flickering of the lights in my room, too. Ah. Huh. So, and I know the internet connection is stable, so this is possible. It's possible that we have an outage <laughs> in what we do. <laughs> so, I don't know. So, um, I don't know. Unfortunately, that's what we have to go by. Maybe, maybe we can leave it there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I can also write to him separately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's going to be the best. Uh, maybe before you finish, Flaminia, last comment, if you can go to the very final, the thank you slide. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, I think we need to be uh, clear here that that's not Waterloo, if people want to come to Perimeter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm cheating here. This is Toronto. This is not Perimeter. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, uh, thank you very much, Flaminia, for the great talk. Thank and you, Edu. <laughs> that's all time, Flaminia. Thank you. <laughs> all right, I'm going to pause the recording. All right, our next speaker is uh, Salman uh, Ipek. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but if not, please correct. Oh, perfect. All right, nice. Uh, uh, so uh, from the University of Albany, and uh, he's gonna talk about the entropic dynamics of quantum fields coupled to gravity. Salman, floor is yours 20 minutes. I will give you a five minute warning and you can bite if you need to a little bit into the question then. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, a clear juxtaposition with the previous speaker where there's a superposition of space times here, there's maybe no superposition at all. I couldn't help but notice also the number of slides being vastly different. <laughs> uh, anyway, so let me let me get started. So um, I with the question of what is the relationship between information and physics? Sorry, I'm moving something around here. Um, typically, we like to think of the law, there are the laws of physics and then we use those to manipulate information. I want to sort of invert that question. Um, why is it? Okay. Anyway, okay. So I want to invert that question and ask whether the laws of physics might be an application of the rules for processing information. Now, um, that seems like an unorthodox point of view, uh, but there is some precedent for it. Um, Jaynes, uh, some years ago, was able to establish statistical mechanics in such a similar light. Uh, in recent years, uh, there's been a surge of interest in doing the same thing with quantum mechanics as well. 
and uh, to a lesser extent with general rel relativity too. Um, so the ultimate goal of such a program is ultimately to set the stage for a quantum gravity theory. And more specifically, um, in the event that quantum gravity might not be what we think quantum usually is, that this sort of approach might be able to illuminate what we mean by quantum in a quantum gravity theory. That's, that's the hope, right? So entropic dynamics is a framework for modeling uh, quantum dynamics based on principles of inference and uh, information. So we deal with probability theory, no quantum probabilities, um, entropic updating with Bayesian updating as a special case, and uh, information geometry as well. Um, there's been some work on deriving various aspects of the quantum formalism in previous work. My specific work has touched on relativistic considerations with quantum fields. I also did some work on relational quantum mechanics, but um, touching on the relational approaches of Julian Barbour and his collaborators. Uh, so a little bit of a different perspective there. Um, so one of the appealing features of what James did for statistical mechanics was that he was able to sort of separate what we mean by a microstate and a macrostate. And we want to do a similar sort of clean delineation between those concepts for quantum mechanics as well, because a lot of the issues that come up with uh, interpreting it end up being because of a lack of delineation. So here we specify the ontic microstates, the physical variables that we're interested in, and the macrostates, which capture uh, statistical information about those uh, microstates. So we sort of proceed in just three broad, broad steps. This is unfamiliar to most people, so I just want to actually just familiarize and like give you a bird's eye view of what's going on here. So you want to identify the microstates. We're going to model the dynamics of the probabilities because those microstates are uncertain, and then update the remaining um, macrostate variables subject to the appropriate symmetries. So just for simplicity, we're going to deal with a single scalar field uh, defined upon a three-dimensional uh, curved space with Riemannian metric. Um, it's important to note that that metric is, not, is going to be a dynamical variable, but it does not share the same status. There's no indeterministic Brownian motion associated with the metric. It's going to follow a smooth um, classical trajectory, quote unquote. Um, just to sort of help us organize our picture of what's going on, we can uh, sort of embed the field configurations into a point in a. a so we're going to be interested in modeling the dynamics. And in particular, we want to analyze the dynamics of the field on the basis of incomplete information. So we're going to be dealing with probabilities. And we're going to want to model the uh, dynamics of those probabilities hopefully taking into account uh, available information about how the field is evolving. Uh, to this end, let's make one assumption that the motion of those fields is continuous. This allows us to sort of uh, analyze dynamics as a sequence of short steps. Um, so what we really want is the probability of a short step in configuration space. Um, let's see here. And to obtain that, we're going to um, bypass many of the standard approaches for dealing with such processes. And we're going to use the method of maximum entropy. That's sort of the conceptual, one of the conceptual innovations of entropic dynamics. And to do that, uh, for those who are not familiar with the maximum entropy method, you maximize an entropy relative to a particular prior distribution and subject to the appropriate constraints, which I'll specify. The prior uh, should express just only the information that the fields change by infinitesimal amounts, but is otherwise ignorant about, uh, for instance, correlations between those degrees of freedom. And when we have something that ignores or wipes out correlations, we expect a product, and that's what we have here, a product of of Gaussians. You can derive this as well, but we don't quite have time for that. I've introduced some other variables uh, 
the determinant of the metric just to make everything work out okay. Um, and then also uh, for things to be completely covariant, we're going to have a local dynamics. And so the, the, the notion of the Lagrange multipliers are going to be local parameters that uh, eventually we can identify as a local notion of time. And more specifically, uh, once you have a space time, they are the local proper time of a non-rotating observer going from one embedded hypersurface to another. Um, to sort of the, the major constraint that we want to impose is uh, introduces this notion of a drift potential, which encodes information about correlations. It seems like a weird thing to do, perhaps, but it sort of efficiently embeds a lot of symmetries into our description. And let me explain. So we deal with the dynamics of probability. And so you might think of uh, a trajectory of probabilities and a tangent to that, uh, and then maybe a cotangent and maybe a tangent bundle or a cotangent bundle. Eventually you might get to something like a phase space for your probabilities and its conjugate momentum. Well, this uh, drift potential is going to play a role that's, um, that is related to the conjugate momentum. So as we describe a relativistic process in which these probabilities and, and phases um, evolve covariantly, we're sort of embedding that sort of symmetry into the description of the microscopic process. Uh, with a constraint like this. So that's my long-winded way of sort of explaining how it's weird, but not maybe that weird. Um, uh, grinding through the sort of like algebra, you do get a transition probability. And these are the first couple of moments. It is a Gaussian. So it's like a, a very unorthodox Viner measure is what you And in the limit of short steps, this uh, describes something like a Brownian motion. Okay, so uh, we want to update these probabilities from an initial one to a final one. We're dealing with dynamics and specifically the dynamics of probability. Uh, and we want that to also take into account the information that we've just sort of outlined. So the way to do that is to update using something like a chapman kolmogorov looking equation. But again, the context is, 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 very, is very different. Um, in more standard context, we know that you can go from a integral equation to a differential equation. Uh, here, something similar can also take place, but it's again, there's a wrinkle that must be added because the dynamics is local. So what you have is a set of differential equations, one for each um, point in space. So we call this a local time Fokker Planck equation. And the flow of probability is going to be guided by the metric, which appears here, but also by this new variable phi, which uh, will be the momentum conjugate to rho. Um, but also, it will be um, identified as the phase of the wave function later on. Um, OK, that's just a pretty picture. Uh, OK, so what we want to do is also model uh, the remaining degrees of freedom, which are the metric and the phase. To this end, though, the evolution of those variables is driven by constraints in the form of symmetries. The first one is a uh, familiar symmetry in an unfamiliar context. We're familiar from with the conservation of symplectic structure, for example, in qu classical mechanics, it introduces the notion of a phase space, uh, Hamiltonian generators, so on and so forth. But here, we're using it in a decidedly non-classical context, using probabilities and phases and all sorts of weird stuff. The second symmetry is implements relativistic invariance. It's familiar for those who like to work with the three plus one formulation of general relativity, but again, here it's applied in a somewhat different context. So we want to build a canonical representation. So we have to build a phase space. You can be systematic about this by constructing uh, trajectories and cotangent bundles 
or I can just sort of skip to the um, to the answer, which is you want to sort of have a matter um, phase space, a matter sector described by our statistical information about the underlying matter, and then also a gravitational sector. Um, just a quick comment about this. Um, there's a vast literature on what the gravitational degrees of freedom are. Uh, here, we've just picked the most basic ones to sort of like test our, our approach. Uh, but obviously you can, there's a whole plethora of different variables that have been tried to describe the gravitational phase space um, or gravity. Okay. Uh, these variables, I, I'm just sort of going fast through this. They um, satisfy the standard Poisson brackets that you would expect for canonical variables. Okay, so now, so far I've talked about these this notion of a surface and specifically the surface has maybe like a metric associated with it. And we haven't talked at all about how this fits in with relativity. Um, and the key idea is that of embeddability. If you have these surfaces, you wanna require that they be embedded within the same space time, which can be very constraining. So there's the notion of a deformation of a embedded hypersurface. So you can, uh, you can deform it either perpendicular to the original surface or tangential to it. And that's what a deformation is. So consider the following argument and then it'll come into play again. This is due to Teitelbaum and uh, Kuchash. So I keep doing that, okay. So uh, imagine that you have an, uh, an initial surface and you apply two different deformations to it, distinct ones, one and then the other, and then you apply it in the reverse direction, the other and then the one. And in general, these are gonna lead to two completely distinct surfaces. This is completely kinematical. It just has to do with surfaces embedded in a given space time. Uh, but if these surfaces are embedded in the space time, then there must be a third deformation, a uh, compensating deformation that leads from one final surface to the other one. But this one is not at all arbitrary and you can determine it. Uh, that's what Teitelbaum did. Uh, and this leads to the notion of um, the generators of these surface deformations satisfy what's called, it's an algebra in quotation marks. Uh, normally when we think of an algebra, what we mean is something with a constant structure constants, right? They have to be constant. But here you see on the right hand side that there's a metric that appears, which is decidedly not constant. So hence quotation marks for algebra. We want to sort of implement, um, and this is similar to what uh, Dirac, Hohmann, Kushash, and Teitelbaum did in a different context. Uh, we want to impl impose a similar sort of scheme to, on our um, canonical variables, which are dynamical. So uh, following that, we want to introduce a set of local Hamiltonian generators because we have a canonical formalism. And we can evolve from uh, one instant to the next using those using exactly those generators. And so, what we want is to uh, impose this principle of path independence. If there are many ways to evolve from an initial to a final state, these they must agree. And so, if I just do the same sort of construction, you you evolve one way, you evolve another way. And then you require that these two methods, that these two methods agree. That's foliation invariance, essentially, is what you've done. So and, I have five minute warning then. Oh, okay. Very good. Um, so imposing such a constraint uh, leads to those canonical generators satisfying a similar algebra to the um, that of surface deformations, but here. Um, they're supplemented by what are known as the Hamiltonian constraints, which turn out to be important. Um, so there's a lot of math that goes into this slide and we're skipping all of it. Um, there is a simplification, a technical simplification, uh, because it's sort of daunting to solve these equations, but um, on the matter sector of the super Hamiltonian, the H uh, perpendicular, 
we assume that there's no uh, dependence on the gravitational momentum that allows us to sort of um, uh, actually get some of these expressions. The gravitational super momentum is what you expect from general relativity. Uh, and for the matter sector, we've restricted ourselves to a, um, a suitable sort of smaller family of possible Hamiltonians. This is not the full set by any stretch. Um, so just to sort of cap this off and maybe I'll have time to just discuss what all of this might mean and how it relates to sort of some, maybe some of the other things going on at this conference. Um, what you wanna do is um, transform from those two real variables of probability and phase to complex coordinates. Um, when, once you do this, you the uh, those Hamiltonians, the matter sector, which I've just written for brevity here, um, can be written as the expectation value of these operators. Um, you can do the sort of things that you expect. You can evolve once you've um, once you've uh, established these generators. You can construct a space time. You can evolve your variables along a foliation. Um, and what it looks like here is that the evolution of the quantum state looks very much like a linear Schrodinger equation. But it's important to remember that the variables that appear here are not all independent. They are subject to these constraints, which means implicitly what you have is that the metric, for example, is a uh, tacit sort of functional of the quantum state. So this is this is intrinsically nonlinear sort of time evolution. Okay. Um, okay, and it's also interesting that what you put on a slide depends very much on what you can fit onto it without it making making it look bad. So there are gravitational um, it, there are equations for the dynamics of the uh, metric and its conjugate momentum, but they look kind of ugly on the slide. So they are equivalent to that plus the Hamiltonian constraints are equivalent to the semi-classical Einstein equations once you project them down to a particular surface. Um, those are, this equation is familiar from the literature, but here it's derived from first principles. Um, okay, so I just wanna talk about that and then, and then I'll be done. So uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the literature of these semi-classical equations, uh, many kind of Harvard, it's one of the reasons that people don't like them is that it's very ad hoc the way that they're normally um, introduced. Uh, this is not quite right. In the early 80s, I believe Kibble and his grad student um, used a Schrodinger picture and an action principle to derive that. Here, we've gone a, a step further by maybe outlining some further principles of the quantum sector. Uh, and in principle, we've, we've derived these based on a set of assumptions that on one hand, uh, the, on the gravitational sector, they reconstruct general relativity through the work of DHKT. On the quantum sector, we've successfully reconstructed many aspects of uh, quantum theory. So it's interesting that you put them together and you get this, um, the semi-classical equations. Um, uh, and I'm going to finish in a second. I just want to say there is some uh, objection to them because they imply superluminal communication. This is, again, this is the importance of actually having a first principles derivation of some of these things. That very much depends on what you call a measurement. If you do the collapse postulate, yes. If your version of measurement is that the measuring device follows the same causal flow as any other process, then it's very unlikely to me that entropic dynamics will lead to superluminal communication. That's what I'm gonna hopefully be working on in the future. And I did talk about how the fact that this Schrodinger equation is implicitly nonlinear, and it will be interesting to see if there are any appreciable violations to some of the quantum classical results. Um, like uh, no cloning theorems and how you prepare states, uh, what is a superposition, things of that nature. Um, okay, and I'm done.
So thank you to everyone who listened. I hope I didn't uh, put you to sleep. Uh, thank you to my advisor and also to um, you, Albany, for supporting me. All right. Thank you very much, Salman. We're going to take questions now, the usual, the usual method. <clears throat> Please uh, use the raise hand feature. Is that good, huh? Okay, sorry, that, that's like a very old teaching comment. <laughs> so I don't see, um, I don't see any questions. Uh, yeah. Oh, Rob, yes. Rob, uh, let me just let you unmute yourself. Now you can unmute yourself, Rob, and welcome back. Yeah, <laughs> Leah, my internet won't conk out the way it did last time in the middle of a question. Uh, sorry about that, Flaminia. I got your email. I'll get back to you. I just, can you go back to where the nonlinearity of the Schrodinger equation is? Um, yes. Um, I believe it would be uh, essentially this, this slide, yes? Uh, yeah. So you're saying it comes in in the fact that... Uh, uh, what, I, what I'm wondering is, have you looked at the circumstances under which it would become linear and um, investigated that, I, I, I've right? invest the weak fields or some such thing? Yeah, if you sort of look at, well, obviously you do expect that it would become linear when you can sort of uh, neglect the contribution of matter onto the space-time um, and if you just sort of look at the vicinity of like something like a vacuum, you'll see that it 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 looks um, it it begins to look linear in that vicinity. Yeah. What about a constant curvature space time? Um, I haven't I haven't done any calculations as such. Um, I would I would imagine that that's a possibility. But again, let me think. That, that's not any that's not something that I've, I've done specifically but it's definitely something that I'm going to be looking into I mean it seems to me it's the simplest thing to try yes in your approach so uh, anyway that's the suggestion no okay. thank you I, I really appreciate it yeah some of the other things that I'm looking into doing more specifically is because uh, a lot of things more related to for example, there's uh, this widely cited Newton-Schrodinger equation, which is kind of got some dubious origins. It would be interesting if uh, there's something to say about that as well. That's a nonlinear equation, for example. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, thank you, Robert okay. Tillman. Cisco has another question. OK, cool. Just a very quick one. Um, I was just wondering under what circumstances you would get corrections to the semi-classical Einstein equation coming from this approach? Um, so corrections in, in which direction? So, you know, you would expect that you've got this and you could go in the, so, so could you specify what you mean by corrections so, so, there? So, like, uh, so, okay, sorry. Do you, do you think it's exact? given this entropic oh, approach. Oh, do I, well, I mean, he, here's the thing. I Do I think that these equations are, um, yeah, these equations are exact. They're not coming from it's a, an underlying approximation of a quantized gravity theory. Is, is that what you're asking? I'm, I'm just wondering if there's any wiggle room in, the, in your, uh, the assumptions of your framework to give you something that maybe, for instance, uh, is related to, um, stochastic uh, oh. back reaction coming from your your matter sector um, or that's any of the things that, that we we would we we've already kind of derived um, in the low energy quantum gravity. Uh, that, that's right. Okay, so the wiggle room would be yes. So that's something that I'm I'm working on right now, and it's a question of how do you include the fluctuations of the metric itself. Is that okay? That's kind of what you're getting at. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. I didn't know exactly which direction you were talking about. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. So it, 
including fluctuations in something like the metric is something that I'm looking at. There is some work on this. The work of Marcel Reginato is very related to the for framework that I have here and includes such fluctuations. There's also a paper that's not that recent, but what I think, uh, I think Professor Oppenheim um, uh, calls a post-quantum theory in which he allows for the uh, gravitational field to be described by a, a density, sort of like you would have maybe in a um, statistical mechanics and sort of making it a classical quantum mix in that direction. There are some ways, I'm aware of the stochastic gravity literature. I don't know that exactly how I would recover what they have, um, but perhaps it's, it's possible. If you're talking specifically about quantum gravity or sto stochastic gravity rather. Uh, well, yeah, the, the stochastic part just comes from interpreting path integrals yes. in a low energy quantum gravity approximation. You could just reinterpret it doesn't have a stochastic origin. You could just reinterpret mm -hmm. the path integrals as as being stochastic because they have the same structure. Um, but yeah, I anyway. think that one of the motivations for this was that maybe we wanted to, and I didn't get into it as much here. One of the motivations which I couldn't get across was, I mean, taking seriously the the concern the gravitational field should not be something that you quantize and. So maybe gravitation, uh, gravity is something that's emergent. So there's some uh, parallel work going on where maybe you model the uh, gravitational field in terms of maybe like um, some sort of microscopically fuzzy sort of description of space and it emerges from that. And in which case it's not entirely appropriate to quantize it. So that once once that motivation is is once I highlight that you'll see that maybe that's that's not a direction that I've thought about going. Fair. Th thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any more questions? If there are any, uh, let's thank Salman again. Thank you very much. Nice talk. Thank you. Clap on behalf of all the people who are silenced. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so we're going to move to the next speaker of the session. I'm going to pause this recording. All right, the last speaking of this session is uh, Nitika Shakawardi. I don't know, I'm sorry about that. I probably butchered your name. Uh, you can correct me. Uh, the Nitika is at Perimeter Institute as well. And uh, she's going to talk about revisiting the Gosseloid framework. Nitika, floor is yours, 20 minutes, whenever you want. OK. Um, so I'm going to present uh, ongoing work, and uh, this is regarding the causal light framework, uh, and there's a really old paper, uh, and I'm digging it up and revisiting it, and I will convince you why I'm doing so. Uh, the talk will also involve a quick crash course on uh, this framework, uh, but uh, let's get through this. Um, we can do this. Okay. So um, this comes from a paper by Lucien Hardy, the causal light framework. And the motivation there is uh, trying to carve a path towards quantum gravity. And essentially the idea is that um, you have general relativity where you have uh, deterministic uh, nature, but you also have dynamic causal structure within general relativity. And on the other hand, in quantum theory, you have fixed causal structure uh, but you have probabilistic nature. And the idea is that, well, if you want to have a theory of quantum gravity, you would want to have uh, the radical aspects of both these theories coexisting. Um, and, and that has led to a study, uh, to the study of the field called indefinite causal structure, uh, where many of the speakers and participants in RQI also work on, on these things. Um, so I will try to talk about why I'm revisiting this, this particular paper, um, which falls within the purview of indefinite causal structures. So a quick cr uh, crash course, uh, this framework. So now imagine that there is a person in a, in a box, uh, isolated from the world, 
and has a stack of papers. Um, and the stack of papers have some information on it, specifically data recorded uh, from experiments. Uh, this person hasn't done these experiments. He, he just has, he or she uh, just has uh, these data cards. And what you essentially have recorded on these data cards are X, some X uh, variable, which is some location. It could be space time. It could be uh, something more general. Um, and the actions performed that uh, refer to the procedure. And then observations, which refer to the outcome. And now this person organizes these cards such that cards with all uh, the same label X location are in one pile and so on. And you can call this set of cards a set. And so we have the set of our X here for some region. And then we have some subset of that uh, set of cards for some particular procedure set. And then a further subset. Uh, I hope you're seeing my cursor. Let me know if you're not, because I'm using it. Um, oh, thanks. Um, and then you have uh, some outcome, which is even uh, a further subset of the procedure set. Okay. And now this person is supposed to tell you uh, something about the physical theory uh, uh, that underlies the experiments being done. And uh, this, is, this is the framework, essentially. This is what we are doing, right? Okay. Um, So, so now, uh, now that we have uh, um, that picture in mind, what we are going to do is we are going to formulate the causal light framework in a, di a diagrammatic representation, which wasn't done in the original paper. And we are going to study uh, meta compression, which, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute. So getting back to this picture, what we are interested in is, um, now we have these regions. Uh, so we are interested in the probability of some outcome in region R i uh, given some any outcomes in some other region and the procedure sets in these two regions. This is the goal. So this is the person in the box is trying to find these probabilities. And the assertion is that um, any physical theory at least must correlate this data, and this data includes the probabilities um, because these are experiments being done. Okay, so this is the assertion, and because of this correlation um, between these recorded data, what, uh, what we have is that we don't really need all these data cards. We need a subset of information, and there is redundancy in these cards. So we are trying to compress that and we'll call that physical compression because the physical theory underlying these experiments it is what will govern how much we can compress this data. Okay, um, good. So in the causal light framework, we have three levels of compression. Um, we are calling this uh, in this in this work, the tomographic, the compositional and the meta compressions. Uh, and my work mostly pertains in the third and we have to go through the first two. So, so let's go, go through it, but uh, feel free to ask me questions now if, if uh, those questions are important to the extent that we cannot, you cannot proceed and understand the next slides. Um, uh, I would encourage those questions so that uh, as many people can be on board with this. Okay. So the first level is essentially you just take all the cards from one region. We are considering only a single region. Um, and, and the probabilities we are interested in are over the, procedure, uh, the outcomes and procedures of this one region, but we also have to consider what happens in the rest of the uh, regions in some sense. So that, that becomes a generalized preparation for uh, this region. We are not considering conditional probabilities here because, uh, because it's better to work with uh, these joint probabilities, um, and we are not working with conditional probabilities on, uh, I mean, on um, procedures. Since so, this y is here, not here, but but we can always use uh, probability rules later to find it. Okay. 
So let's get to the crux of this. So we are interested in this probability. And now what this card cards have is all possible measurements and all possible outcomes. And what you can simply do is list them, uh, list the probabilities. Uh, and we call this big P, this vector. And then uh, if you're interested in a particular uh, outcome, we use an R, we take an inner product between these two vectors, where R is trivially just one in the place in which uh, uh, the probability we're interested in. Say you're interested in alpha I, so that position would be one and everything else is zero, and then you get this probability. Uh, this is a very non-compressed version of doing things, and we know um, that there are, for just a qubit, you can have uh, infinite set of information for each procedure. So, but we also know the existence of fiducial sets. So the basis in which we can write things down. And therefore what we do is we reduce the P, which is just a list over all these, um, all possible probabilities to a smaller set. And this index is belongs to the set omega Ri. And the idea is that this probability, uh, this list of probabilities is sufficient uh, to find any, any outcome, uh, any, any particular alpha i probability we're interested in. And now um, we can write also similar to this big R, we can write similar Rs for, for Li's, each Li, where they are just one in a particular position. And now you can have a matrix multiplied over it that gives you back R alpha i. So essentially, this lambda, this matrix here is going to be very rectangular because the number of alphas will be much higher than the number of L's. Um, and then uh, the compression essentially is with respect to this, the size of these omega sets. Okay. So now like just to, just to uh, bring us back to things we know um, in classical probability theory, uh, the size of one region for, let's say, an n-dimensional uh, generalization of a bit would be n square because um, we are doing tomography essentially over a classical uh, n bit. And similarly, for uh, for a q -dit, um, with d equals to capital N, for quantum theory, you have n power four. So this is essentially what the GPTs also studies the generalized probability theories. If you are, if you've heard of them, and um, this compression tells you something about the physics involved already. So the size of your omega sets, uh, given your information, uh, your unit of information, will tell you something. Okay, that's why we call it tomographic compression. Going on, um, the second level is compositional compression. We now consider two regions. We've done compression over single regions and that's the maximum you can get, co compression you can get when you only consider a single region. Now you consider two regions. Now think about quantum theory. Again, you have two operators can be uh, uh, related to each other in multiple ways. For example, if you look at this simple circuit, A and B are, uh, uh, you take the tensor product over them. So if you take these two regions, you will not find any uh, compression because all these degrees of freedom exist even after taking the tensor product. On the other hand, if you have two, two operators which are causally sequentially related, you would, you would get uh, another map. And this map will essentially be uh, you will need lower number of uh, parameters to define this map than you would to define C and B separately. So we call these kind of regions causally adjacent and those are the ones which will show compositional compression. Okay. And then there's also what you can think of as the super map, which is studied uh, in indefinite causal structures where um, you write uh, this as D question mark B, but C can be you can think of C as an intervention in here and you have to insert C in here and you can get some probabilities. But because C, is an, C can be arbitrarily anything, you don't see any correlations on gen, in general. So um, 
So now more formally, uh, I'm not going to go through it in step by step, but essentially we have the same goal, the probability in these two regions, we want to find a general probability. Um, so we first do the first level compressions that we just talked about for each of these regions, but then we also do a second level compression. And essentially the first level compressions, L1 belong to omega set one and L2 belong to omega set two. So for these two regions, you just have the Cartesian product over these uh, omega sets. But can we do better? And that's what, that's what this lambda encodes where you have K1, K2 belonging to omega 1, 2, which can be a subset of this. Um, so, so essentially, if you have some causal adjacency, you will see some compression. Uh, and this will kind of tell you the causal map between these regions uh, when you study this compositional compression. Now we've only discussed uh, in detail the two regions compositional compression, but you can consider three region, four region, and so on. And that is all the, all the kinds of compressions you can do really. Uh, and at this point, now we are done. Uh, so uh, we are done, but uh, so this is just the diagrammatic representation of this equation. Um, and, and we want to uh, push the idea that this helps with um, us being able to work with the causal framework. The arrows do not denote time. This, this is just the order of compressions you're doing. So you're taking, you're going from your full set of data to a smaller uh, set of information you need uh, to specify all probabilities of the theory, okay. And now finally we come to third level compression and you have all these lambda matrices from the first level compression and the second level compressions. So remember, going back that the lambda matrices are, are the ones that you need to go from arbitrary R alpha one, alpha two, to the fiducial sets essentially. Um, and the third level uh, compression, which we call meta compression because now we are working on lambdas, is that can you have some rules that you reduce this set because this set is what specifies this big lambda, which we call the causal light. And essentially for arbitrary R, uh, we, you can write it as a, a, a product over the causal light product, uh, which is specified by this lambda. So now meta compression is essentially like trying to compress this huge set of uh, lambda matrices that we have further, okay. So now I'm going to get into a particular example of this. Um, I mean, warning, Nika. Yes, thank you. Um, so let's consider three regions, only three regions. And we do all, we find the causal light. So the causal light is essentially this set of lambda matrices. Um, and now we are doing this here. So we do the first level compressions, which you see here. We do the second level compressions there are only three possible ones for three regions. And then you do a three, three region compositional compression. So these are all the compressions that you can do for three regions, which is why we are considering this small case. And when you write this down, um, this, is already, this is already absorbing the first level compressions. I haven't explicitly written them down. Um, corresponds to this expression. Um, okay. And now uh, what question you can ask is, well, uh, do we really need this three region, region compression, compositional compression, or and can it be um, um, reduced in some sense? Uh, so what we do is we equate this uh, with only doing th third level compression. Um, and then if you consider like a quantum circuit, for example, or any, any theory where you have region one sending some, some system to R2, sending it to R3, you can reduce the equations we had earlier, this equation particularly, to find that the third level, uh, sorry, the compositional compression for three regions, this lambda, can be written as a sum over compositional compression over two regions. Um, 
And this can be done in certain kinds of theory only, including quantum theory and uh, classical probability theory, where the omega set takes the structure um, of this form. What this says is in meta compression, you don't need three, three regions or more uh, to be compositionally compressed. You only need to do your first level compressions. Uh, and then you also need to do your two region compositional compressions and that is sufficient. So this is, this is what, uh, this is what we uh, study. And this is a general form um, Sorry, yeah, this is the slide I wanted to go to. Yes, this is, so we had this relation and you can generalize this for N regions and write down the, the form uh, in terms of omegas and lambdas for compositional compression of two regions. Um, so, so, and similarly, you can do this for uh, so on further. So for example, here we are doing compositional compression of two regions is sufficient, but some theories might and then you would have to go to three regional comp compositional compression and find uh, the next uh, relevant equations. Um, and this is the causal hierarchy that we're defining here. And then the next step is really just to populate this hierarchy. And we show that uh, I'm not including this in this presentation at the moment, but this is like a huge project at, uh, 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 that we are working on and essentially the duo tensors, which is a general formalism by uh, Lucien Hardy for that, that has a general form for quantum theory or classical probability theory, or generally theories that can be written in terms of circuits. Um, those, those fall under the first rung of the causal hierarchy. We are constructing a, a, a model uh, called the trio tensors, which would fall in the next uh, level of the hierarchy where two region compositional compression will not be sufficient or may not even make sense. And you have to do three region compositional compression um, and, and so on. So um, yeah, thank you. And I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you very much, Monica. Uh, if there are questions, please use the raise hand feature uh, or again, signal visibly so that uh, Rick can see you. I don't see any questions yet. Okay, maybe maybe I have one uh, one question. Um, so how am how am I so if I were to understand uh, superpositions of different causal structures and how they interfere, uh, uh, in the if I were to can you show the the example that you had? Um, uh, stop me. This one. Yeah, there, there we go. There we go. Okay. So, but I think I got a little bit lost as as to the okay maybe I'll ask in a different way. Uh, <laughs> Can you again summarize what the three regions, the three regions that you can see in this example are? Okay, so the three regions are essentially what you start with. It could be anything. It could be many quantum systems. It could be, uh, but essentially all the cards in the data set that have the same location. Uh, so I'm, I'm just trying to put it in, in space time in a way, right? Trying to think about this in terms of- yeah. Okay, so, how, okay, let me okay. give an example. Please, so please. consider the data cards actually had the location in terms of space time. Let's say we wanted to uh, deduce general relativity or special relativity right. from, uh, from your data cards that pertain to experiments where that theory is, is, uh, is valid. Um, then uh, what you do is you have these set of cards uh, with each space time point separated into stacks. And then these three regions could be just three regions of space time uh, uh, that are separate. Um, and now you don't really know if these three regions are, uh, so like any two regions, if they're space like separated or time like separated or so on, you don't know that at the moment. But then you, you do these compressions and then you find, find out um, if they are. 
Right. Uh, and in principle, uh, what if you are working in a framework that you don't have a definite causal structure? Is that easy right. to handle like this? Yeah, I mean that uh, that would be the that would be what we definitely want to be able to cover right. because we want to be able to causal structures. So, so this is a this is a way of formalizing the, the, the operationally formalizing what it would be like uh, in, in not making any assumptions about what the causal structure is, right? Exactly. Now I regret not mentioning the word operational before because this is essentially an operational framework, um, which should be able to incorporate uh, quantum gravity, but doesn't tell you what it is, right? right, right. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, that was very clarifying. Thank you for the answer. Thank you for asking. Uh, no problem. Any other questions? Anybody? Okay. If there aren't any more questions, then let's thank Nidika again. Thank you for the talk, Nidika. The talk. And please thank let's you. thank all the speakers of the session as well. Thank you. Uh, remember that uh, there will be, uh, well, two things to remember. There will be no Australian sessions anymore. Uh, so, well, anymore, I mean. <laughs> related to this conference. And uh, also, the, so we will see you uh, next week at the same time. And uh, also remember that the, the recordings of the sessions will be posted on the YouTube playlist that uh, we send by email. So you can always check the talks over there. There are also both the Waterloo sessions and the Australian sessions. All right, thank you. And this is uh, the end of the fifth session of uh, this conference. And I hope I will see all of you again next week at the same time. Thank you everybody for coming.